Hello and welcome as you join us today um, on the National Grid stand on the Green Zone at COP. I'm Claire Dicta, I'm UK Head of Strategy at National Grid and I am delighted to be joined today by these two wonderful people sitting to the side of me. We have um, Lolita Jackson, MBE, who is Director of Communications and Sustainable Cities at um, Sustainable Development Capital, but um, prior to that was um, Special Advisor on Climate Policy in the New York Mayor's Office. We also have Emma Pinchbeck, who is CEO of Energy UK and has been a lifelong climate activist, I think it's fair to say, starting out her career at WWF before finding her way to her current role. So, today at COP is Gender Day and um, I'm really excited to have um, uh, these two amazing women join me um, in our conversation today where we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion and how important that that is as we decarbonize our economy and as it's gender day at COP the UK government has um, recognized that and this morning they have highlighted how women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate change they tend to be in um, poorer communities and um, doing um, uh, more roles like farming and things which are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. So the UK government this morning has committed £165 million to tackle gender equality um, with a view to making our actions on climate change um, equal and ensuring that we bring everyone with us. Um, as you've probably guessed from her previous role, Lolita is from the US, um, Emma is from the UK, so I'm particularly delighted that we can bring a UK and a US perspective to this session today. So I probably um, jump straight in if that's okay and maybe Lolita I'll come to you first and say um, welcome, first of all, thank you so much for joining us and it would be fantastic if you could give us some of your perspectives of um, how important it is that we think about diversity and inclusion when we're tackling climate change and maybe some of the perspectives from your time in the New York Mayor's office of um, sustainable cities and, and, and how you factor those types of things into your, into your work there. Sure. Well. First of all, most cities, um, many people work, live in cities more so than they ever did in the past. In the United States, that number is actually 83% of people live in cities, as well as 56% worldwide. And as we know, cities are driven by people who are able to live there, work there, and thrive there. Cities are also very diverse. So in New York City, for example, probably similar to London, uh, over 40% of the people who are in that city, in New York City, are from another country. They're culturally very diverse. Their languages are very diverse. And we need to make sure that the people who are in those communities feel connected to being able to um, live their lives the way that they can um, through having clean air, clean water, um, the ability to get to work, the ability to have good jobs. And one of the things that we've done in New York City in particular is that we've made sure that we have an equity lens in all the work that we do around climate. So for example, we have climate plans that we've done over the years, over the last 14 years now, where we make sure that the people who are the least in a community are able to get the results of all the climate actions that we do. We had a significant um, issue that happened in New York City called Hurricane Sandy that happened in 2012. And most of the communities hit by that hurricane were actually poor communities in New York City, many uh, who uh, have many significant single mothers in those communities. And I give the example of a mother, a single mother who lives in a community called East Harlem. She may be a single mother, her child may have asthma. So there's a few things that happen around that. That child misses school a few days a month she cannot have steady hours at a job that she may have. She may have to stay home with that child. She may not be able to go back and get a degree. So for us, we talk about climate change through the lens of that mother so that we can clean up the air so that her child no longer has asthma, that he's able to not miss school and do better in school, that she can go and get a different job. 
And so when we talk about climate, at least in New York City, we make sure that we're including all those communities in our solutions. And I do know that 40% of the money that is uh, pledged in President Biden's new bill is supposed to go to environmental justice communities, many of whom, again, are headed by single mothers or women who are at, out in the workforce trying to make a living for their families. So in the U.S., and particularly in cities, I think that we're trying to move as far as we can toward gender equality and climate. Great, thank you. Um, I want to come back to you on that. I've got so many questions to ask, but um, Emma, maybe I'll come to you first. And I will remind everyone, it should be on the bottom of your screens, I think, but we do have the ability to hear to take questions, if I can work technology. So um, the hashtag that you need to use to submit questions is on your screens, but it's hashtag diversity energy transition, and that's on Slido. So please do send your questions in. And I will, um, I will pass those to Lolita and Emma as we're talking. But Emma, maybe you could give the, the UK perspective of some of those aspects that Lolita is talking about. Yeah, so clearly, I mean, we should say from the off-right that when we're talking about um, vulnerability to climate change and the impacts of climate change, the UK and the US are going to be better off than many parts of the world. And when we're talking about the need to look after women and girls and vulnerable groups globally. We're thinking primarily about nations like in Bangladesh, where they're already experiencing massive internal displacement and flooding, or the small island nations here. That said, just like in the rest of the world, if you are already vulnerable, so if you're already in poverty, if you're already from um, an ethnic minority group or a minority group, I mean, women are not a minority group, but they, in the economy, they're treated that way. And if you're already um, disadvantaged, climate change just exacerbates those things. And I think Lita's right. In, a, in an urban context, for example, if we take air quality, you know, the health implications for that are, yeah, absolutely about children. I live in a city. I've got a little girl. They think she's asthmatic already and she's not even two. And, and I think there's something about that which is gendered, but also those health outcomes affect women differently. For example, you know, um, air quality and poor air quality affects things like breast milk. You know, we're finding microplastics in children in utero. So there are, there are consequences of this that play out in a gendered way. The other thing we haven't talked to, though, is the benefits of doing things differently can also disproportionately benefit those groups, and that's great. So if we improve air quality, disproportionately good for already poor communities, and that applies in the UK too. If we manage to make homes warmer and more efficient, disproportionately better for people in terrible rental accommodation or who are paying very high energy bills. So I often think about the chance to re-engineer the economy is a chance not just to do it better for climate change reasons, but for equity ones too. And I think cities, which are such big cauldrons for change, where we've got really diverse communities, same here in the UK, you know, London, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Glasgow, that's where we have really diverse communities. If we get cities right first, we'll see those benefits playing out there first. And I think that's, that's a lot of the reason to focus our resources in those spaces. And you talk about, you've both talked about um, groups that are already vulnerable being disproportionately impacted. Um, and, and Emma, you and I have, um, we've already had one chat today, um, and we were talking about some of those aspects that you've just raised around um, equity and the, um, the impacts that, that different siloed parts of government policy play into climate and, and how really at the minute i think probably both in the uk and the us but you can disagree with me that there's government policy and there's economic policy and then there's like climate policy over here somewhere and how do you start to bring those things together so that you are thinking about the whole spectrum and not kind of going well today we're going to talk about climate change and how we're going to fix that and then tomorrow we might talk about um, the, the, the single mother who can't access you know childcare or health care and how do you start to bring those things together maybe Lolita do you how 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 kind of forefront is that do you think in in the political perspectives in the US 
Well, what's starting to happen is that many cities in the U.S. have put together climate plans. And in the midst of putting together climate and resilience plans, they recognize that it touches all as aspects of their city's society. So particularly health impacts, even in places that, um, for example, have heat island effect, which means that some parts of a city get hotter than others. When we have heat waves in the United States, where you've probably read the temperature got up to 116 degrees in a city called Portland, Oregon, which normally doesn't get hot, heat, it, heat to that degree at all. In fact, many people don't have air conditioning, and we're going to see a lot more things like that. So the impacts of climate change are actually hitting many cities in ways that they had not anticipated prior. So those planning processes have to be put into everything. COVID. COVID in New York City was largely a disaster in the, the EJ communities, the communities that were already impacted by bad environmental health conditions. So many people had secondary conditions that made them more um, keen to be able to unfortunately get COVID. We had 800 people a day dying in New York City at one point, and many of them had pre-existing conditions because of where they lived. So we're recognizing that the cost of not dealing with climate and everything that we do, even transport, people can't get certain jobs if they don't live anywhere near them. So we need to make sure that there's accessible transport and transport oriented to development. So we've really put our climate policies in New York City central to a lot of what we're doing. And I think a lot of other cities are copying those models by being part of networks like C40 and UK100 and other networks around the world that are connecting people to be resourced and get the best practices they can from one another to help understand how climate affects everything that they're doing. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, I'm just going to be like what Lolita said for this whole time. Um, but the, there's two things I think. One is broadly about our economic policy and how we consider it. So the our evaluation framework, right? And for at, at national levels, if you look at GDP in most economies and how we evaluate economic success, we're pretty terrible at costing in co these things like co-benefits. So, st but co-benefits to a lot of people, particularly people that are disempowered from the current economic model, are the thing. So, um, you know, to give you an example, in the UK, uh, some some years ago now, we did a pilot scheme where, with the local healthcare budget, um, we were investing in. Uh, low carbon heating systems and energy efficiency in people's homes and the reason for that was that there was reduced hospital emissions for respiratory illnesses from what was essentially an energy problem and if we'd uh, there are two problems with that in how we think about policy firstly at national level it's very rare that you'll get the health department and the energy department sitting down together who institutionally makes that happen and the second really big problem is none of those health benefits are costed in when we're thinking about the costs of climate change so it always does my head in when we have a conversation about oh net zero is expensive expenses for whom because and and what costs and benefits are you looking at exactly and on the this is a rant now on the expenses for whom bit um, I think we also, though, have to be careful in the transition that we're, faring, uh, that we're funding things affordably across the economy, and that's the much more interesting question about how you do it justly. And then lastly, and the other thing I want to say is it's about including voices into how we design the change from the beginning. So one's, one problem is the economic model, the other is who are we listening to? And in the UK, we do a lot of stuff through Westminster. We do a lot of stuff through our national government. And for things like cities, you probably need to bring in, you know, de devolved and regional governments. You need to bring in community groups. You need to bring in trusted actors who can speak for communities beyond just the, the central Whitehall government. Both those things are a massive institutional challenge. They require change for officials. But I think they're probably necessary to getting what has got to be a just transition away. See, that ties in really nicely to a question that we've had about leadership. So the question was, you know, what role does leadership, national leadership have to play in this? And if I can kind of narrow our conversation down a little bit temporarily, um, but, you know, a, a lot of our policy and a lot of these decisions and the, and the direction is being set. Um, nationally either through Westminster and through the Biden administration or at a state level largely still dominated by a very narrow demographic and what do you think needs to happen to change that to ensure that that decision-making process is being representative? 
start, I, I would say in the U.S. we're, we're lucky in that uh, the, the system of government that we have gives actually states and cities a significant amount of power. So New York City and, and the New York State and other states like that are able to institute some of their own policies that don't depend on the national government. In fact, when the Trump administration came into power, it really activated U.S. cities and states, okay, we have to get our acts together and do things ourselves. And so those, those uh, bonds that those cities have and those states have got a lot stronger. And so a lot of climate policy actually got passed significantly during a time when the national government wasn't interested. So we actually were very lucky in the U.S. that we were able to use that moment to do that. But that being said, I think when you have a city in the U.K. that's flooded or a state in the, U uh, the U.S. that loses their power, usually that mayor is the one that everyone complains to. And so they're trying to make sure that action happens. So I think once you have a, an emergency that happens or a shock that happens, happens, you'll find that people are a bit more willing to, to engage, and we hope that it doesn't take a shot going forward, that people understand that it's the right thing to do. But I've, what I've seen is that, A, when the Trump administration was in, people uh, got activated in the U.S., and B, when something happens in your city, even if you're the reddest in the U.S., it's red. I, go, I know in the U.K. it's blue. But if you're that extreme color, when something happens, all of a sudden you're a climate change activist. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a really good question in the UK context because we don't have that much in the way of devolved power. You know, it's not it's not federalised here, and so one straightforward answer in terms of city change would be to copy what's been going on in our industrial clusters. So places like Teesside, where there's a a, a much stronger mayoralty, or um, Liverpool, or Manchester, or Bristol, or or London, where the mayors have considerable power you are seeing a slightly different approach and, and perhaps we need more of that. In, in terms of how you encourage more diversity through, I think representation matters. So at every level of this, politics, business, um, working in the communities, we need to make sure we include new perspectives and be pretty aggressive about pursuing that. I mean, I, I can only talk to the business context, but it's why having things like quotas for the amount of yeah, um, ethnic minorities and women on our boards is a really good idea because that brings diverse perspectives and we're setting the agenda. So, you know, more of that. But also just making sure we have more consultative processes. I'm a representative for industry, so I'd imagine if you're in industry, you're kind of screaming at the idea of adding more complexity to what's already quite a difficult process for change. But I nevertheless think that... We have seen in the UK with things like building onshore wind that public permission is really, really key. And also articulating the benefits to local communities is key. And I'll, I'll finish with that, the kind of this brief anecdote. We wouldn't have a commitment in the UK to build 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 if it wasn't absolutely obvious to government that the significant chunk of the investment we're making for that at national level was going into local communities and that it, had, it was working also to bring forward a diverse and skilled workforce. There is a diversity target in the offshore wind sector deal and so these things are complex and challenging to deliver but they're going to be critical for I think support for the next phase of the transition. Can I just quickly um, yeah, sure. add something to what you said? I want to call out Mayor Marvin Reeves of uh, Reeves, excuse me, of Bristol. He's amazing. He's world renowned across the across the world in this space. So this is just an example of a UK mayor taking initiative and really getting the word out about the importance of all these issues. So I just I have a personal relation with him and I think he's fantastic. This is not a biased view, but the Southwest is the best part of the UK and I won't hear otherwise. That's <laughs> I went to where you originate from, uh, <laughs> hard to guess. Um, you mentioned the East Coast, so in the UK we have a, uh, a stretching target to install 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, which seems very apt as we're sitting in front of the National Grid Interactive Hub looking at um, the vision for the North Sea. Um, We've talked a bit about impact on communities, but net zero requires a lot of investment, and that can be really good for jobs. Um, for There's a phrase in the U UK, Lolita, I'm sure you've heard it, levelling up, so you know, really ensuring that that investment is spread across the UK. But when it comes down to the realities of the infrastructure, 
it impacts communities directly and unfortunately generally sweeping generalization but generally impacts disadvantaged communities how do we how do we tackle that so that those communities like they get a say in the transition and they um, they get benefits from like the, the vital role that they're playing in, in hosting that infrastructure on behalf of the, the rest of the society. I think there's, uh, so this is a very, very much my view because I think industry is honestly wrestling with exactly that question right now. And um, what I would say our lessons learned are from the success we've had so far at decarbonizing the UK are firstly where there's already a lot of change and disruption going on you can do weirdly more change so um, we should be only intervening once in a community and and trying to do it well so for example if we're um, disrupting roads to do I don't know fiber optic for broadband why aren't we doing EV charging at the same time if we're going to be disrupting a community for big transmission connected generation why aren't we thinking through what they might need in terms of say EVs or extra grid for electrification and any of you who's watching as an engineer yes I'm aware that distribution and transmission are not the same networks in the UK but I'm saying it's about the overall footprint for the UK my mum who's up in Lincolnshire does not distinguish between whether a cable has been built for an offshore wind farm or whether we're doing something at district network operator level she just knows there's disruption in her community right so you know don't don't at me um but the the, the thing that we've also learned is that it's got to be long-term benefits you know i think when we started things like renewables it was small projects relatively so when we thought about community benefits it was tied to the project it was like well we'll do um a community centre or a single investment or a community fund for, that's about that wind turbine. I think we need to probably be a lot more creative and self-sustaining about that money. So building, making sure we're training up the next generation of engineers to work on the wind farm, making sure we're investing in skills in the community, making sure it's something that is that has real longevity and is connected to the transition. I think is what people want. You know, fundamentally, they don't want their kids having to move to big cities to have those jobs or to leave their city to go somewhere else to have those jobs we want to be able to, to have a degree of local benefit real local benefit and and i don't know how we do that it's really complicated but i suspect it's that can i add to that because i think workforce development is going to be the key to make sure that communities really buy into the changes that have to happen and one of the things we saw in hurricane sandy when the hurricane happened and a lot of the infrastructure had to be rebuilt or at the very least repaired communities saw people that didn't live there coming in with those jobs and so new york city had a real conversation with itself on if we're going to rebuild all these homes and all this infrastructure that was damaged how do we train people how do we get apprenticeship programs how do we get people in these unions because that's a significant issue as well so that uh, the communities can get the benefits of the jobs that are happening in their own communities and particularly um, the communities that were hit by hurricane sandy unlike a lot of other wealthy places uh, mostly poor people or at least um, lower middle class to middle class people live on the waterfront in new york city so we had actually about 30 percent affordable or um, public housing was affected on the waterfront so those folks saw people coming in from other areas not even new york city long island other states to come in and do that work so we recognize as a city that that needed to change in the future and if we can work with other cities around the country and around the world and figuring out workforce development that helps the companies because the companies need those workers who know how to do this work and right now there's not enough of them and on on cities and, and on workforces i think we need to think about um the fact that a lot of cities grew up around a particular manufacturing industry or a particular technology previously now it's probably similar in the US but basically in the UK cities here sprang up around the manufacturing or the technologies of the previous industrial revolution so they were kind of industrial manufacturing heartlands or they were coastal ports and um, that that means that basically if we're thinking about our big midland cities or, or you know birmingham in the uk or um, coventry these places are now going to be making the technologies or should be making the technologies or have the skills to do things like ev manufacturing in in the future similarly you know we've gone to grimsby and hull and 
a Teesside and these these um, coastal towns where there has been industry before, and we're moving things like the fishing fleet over to service renewables. And, and you know, up here in Scotland, we've got to think about places like Aberdeen, which are huge, huge hubs for an international oil and gas industry that is winding down as renewables scale up. And those workers need to be going into offshore wind because what we don't want is the immense dislocation of introducing new industries that are not relevant for those places. You know, we can't like build, you know, hundreds of new cities worldwide to accommodate the new technologies and new um, business models of the future. We've got to repurpose the infrastructure we really have. Um, we're getting some great questions coming in. Uh, quite a direct one, which I'm going to throw to both of you. So, um, so Emma, you, you head up a, a huge trade association body with a very vast membership. And Lita, you're um, in, investing in, in um, lots of different activities. And we've had a question in to say, what are you, say, your respective organisations, what are you doing to encourage community involvement and participation in local initiatives? Ah, so <laughs> the thing is about trade bodies is that you're both all powerful and not powerful at all. So my job is to, we do do some um, direct work at Energy UK. Actually, particularly, we've got our own diversity targets. So um, it's slightly cheating because with a female chief exec, this is easier, but we commit to 50 a uh, 50 gender split in all of our communications anything you see from us um, publicly or at our own events so our events panels but also um, our media appearances and so on um, and and to do that obviously we need to train our staff and make sure that our executive team and make sure that our board is representative too um, and increasingly we're going to try to work with industry on th those kinds of initiatives and targets we also publish a diversity directory if you're watching this and you've got expertise in climate or energy and you're an interesting and uh, speaker from a diverse background please sign up to it because we use it to help drive uh, more representation and participation and then um, we also do a lot of work with young people. So we've got a brilliant Young Energy Professionals Network who obviously care about things like climate change and diversity. So that's Energy UK. Um, side note, but I'd love to do some more work with schools and, and some more work out in communities too. A lot of um, where infrastructure intersects with policy and communities is obviously done by my members like National Grid. And there our job is to try to make sure that policy drives that interaction and that we facilitate benefits coming back to the public. So um, the affordability of the net zero transition is a core work area for Energy UK. We've got, we've got members like energy retailers who think about bills and we've got members building the infrastructure. So my job is making sure those cost flows are as just and fair as possible. We also have work programmes with industry on the just transition and skills. And, and so... Yeah, I suppose our job is the facilitator for all that good action. And I and the, the, the most fun thing about my job is where possible I try to be a step ahead of my members and kind of nudging them even further than, than industry wants to go. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's me. And Lolita, well, it's, it's quite a shift to go from a role working in the New York mayor's office to, to, a, to a private investment firm where you are now. I, I'm guessing that you had like some personal ethics and motivations going into that, which must have been met um, for you to make that move. But like, what do you see in your organisation and how that kind of permeates through where you invest your funds? Sure. So um, I actually should say a little bit what my background was in the mayor's office, which would make more sense. So I had said that um, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. I was actually responsible for all the elected official community relations as well as the media relations after the hurricane happened. So I actually had to go into those communities where people would come to community meetings who their relatives had died or they lost their business or they lost their home. So I have significant experience on the ground with people dealing with climate. And my last job was as the climate diplomat for New York City. So I was a relationship person for all the cities around the world, the COP process, anything you can think of that was outside of New York State, uh, I dealt with. So this firm hired me because of those relationships and my ability to go into the communities where we have projects and we own companies. And one example of that is the second largest industrial park in the U.S. is something called Eastman Business Park. 
and it's in Rochester, New York. It used to be owned by Kodak. We own all the power generation there. There are 16 different types of power that are generated there. And I initiated through the company to go up and talk to every elected official that represents that area. Also the key local stakeholders in economic development. They were thrilled that we went up there. We want to work with Rochester and help that whole community and not just our company because we recognize it's such a big player. And so we want to have that model rolled out throughout the, uh, the world actually where our assets are and that's sort of why they brought me to the table. So actually front and center to me are the communities where our projects and our businesses are located. It's uh, it's 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 amazing. Like I, I I feel quite inspired sitting with the two of you and like your passion for 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 driving action and keeping this at the front of the agenda. Um, maybe um, I, we've 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 getting loads of questions coming through. Um, we've both we've all talked about the need to have diversity in decision making and leadership, and. Um, uh, we've had someone ask, how can we encourage like a younger, more diverse workforce to really, um, you know, step in and get involved in those in those discussions? I want to start with this because I'm very passionate about this. Um, you can see that I'm black, and um, I majored in chemical engineering in school. Um, so I had sort of the, the credibility to be able to take uh, a significant role in climate. I think we need to encourage more. Um, people of color to major in these particular disciplines, but also even if you don't major in something as specific as climate science or engineering, all of these roles are law, law, you can think of media, law, government relations, all those roles are needed in climate. So anything that you're doing right now can help the environment, can help change the, the systems that we have in place, and we all need to be part of it. I have learned, I'll give one anecdote, after Hurricane Sandy hit, um, well, during Hurricane Sandy, I should say, the place that the Bronx gets its mail was actually in Manhattan and got flooded out. I grew up on welfare. I grew up on public assistance. And back at that time, people used to get their benefits by checks. So it happened on October 29th. Guess what? There was no mail on November 1st. For some people, that meant they wouldn't be able to eat. So for me, in the, the aftermath, I said, we need to make sure the mail gets diverted if we know when the storm is coming, so that doesn't happen to that community. That community actually wasn't physically affected by the hurricane, but because I was at the table and part of the management team, I was able to say that's something that we need to consider. So you need more people like me in senior executive roles to be able to have those conversations at the table, and that's this, my primary example of why it's important to have the voices there, but you have to have the systems and infrastructure there to allow people like me to get the jobs in the first place. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really, powerful example of exactly what diversity is for which is then changing the system which in turn is likely to bring more diverse people through right that's the that's the point and I um, so uh, similar from a, a gender perspective there aren't that many female chief execs in the energy industry and thank goodness that's changing but the thing that has enabled me to do this job at this time in my life because I've got a two-year-old is, is a different approach to work and being able to negotiate that and, and an expectation that I don't do the job like maybe my male predecessors did the job because I've got childcare and I love my daughter and I want to spend time with her. And I like to think that that's going to benefit other women coming through, but it probably also benefits the guys that have had to do a 40 hour week and pretend like everything was fine, wasn't fine. And so I think there's something about including different voices early enough that we can kind of change working culture and change expectations about what you know the, the climate and energy world is about so that we bring more people through so some I don't know some practical things yeah more representation of people and if we have to use quotas to get that so be it but I think including diverse voices around the table and holding businesses to account for that needs to happen I think more inclusive workplaces and concrete working practices that enable that. So we let blind recruit for Energy UK. We take the names off and the um, universities or educational experience off when we're hiring, unless of course it's a kind of scientific role. We, you know, it, so you don't have any unconscious bias when we're looking at forms. We we talk about our flexible working um, programs up front. You know, there, there are things that you can do on your organizational processes to help that and to make people feel included and lastly it's a personal one but I'm here because 
people saw me and thought I was worth investing in. And similarly, uh, you know, that started really young. It started with the state education system that saw that about me. And because of that, I have a degree, the first in my family to have one. Because of that, I have my job. But then once I got to my job, I had senior people spot that they thought I was talented. And yes, support me, but also get out of my way. So I think if you're a leader watching this and you're wanting to be helpful, the biggest thing you can do is seed your platform. And that goes for you including if you're a diverse candidate because there's probably a young diverse person that could have your stage and so i'm trying to think about how i do that too and i think what's really interesting is that um like we're not that diverse for an energy no. panel this is quite diverse but <laughs> in life we're not that diverse yeah. but the really uh, interesting point is uh, there's visible diversity and there's non-visible diversity and actually we've all got backgrounds which you, you just you wouldn't know um, from looking at us and as Lolita says the, um, the, the, the wealth that comes from the diverse backgrounds and the way that you think about things and how you approach things really does add value when you're in a crisis uh, and like climate change is a crisis so just because it's a, a long run crisis it's still a crisis and having people with a different perceptions and attitudes in the room contributing to the discussion will make a world of difference to where we end up I mean, I have to say, you know, I worked for the New York City Mayor's Office for 15 years. I can count at least 10 different times that if I wasn't in the room, the, the thing that I brought up would not have been considered at all. And then people were amazed, like, oh, I never thought of that. Just because of the way I grew up with, with no parents and very little child care and all the things that people take for granted sometimes in the family structures they grew up in. So even if I wasn't black, my family structure was unconventional. I grew up with a grandmother who died at 15. So I was a, basically a foster child with no, no siblings. And so that's a very different childhood than most people that were surrounding me in the office. Um, so I just think ha thinking through diversity in all of its guises, socioeconomic, ethnic, gender, social, sexual orientation, all those things matter when we're making these policies. Yeah, and we've had so, a couple of questions we've had. One is um, saying, you know, the uh, DI, DNI initiatives need to be more than a tick box exercise. Completely agree. And I think we've all like strongly agreed with that. Um, and and there's, a, there's a question for me, which is what's... What do you think that companies like National Grid should be doing? And I think um, I'm going to do the same to you. I agree with everything that Emma and Lolita have said. Um, the, I've got a very, I've got quite a narrow energy industry in the UK view, and it has come on leaps and bounds in the 20 years that I've worked in the industry. Um, like I've got a whole host of uh, anecdotes about. Um, you know, arriving to an operational site and being ushered to go and use the toilet because um, they only had one toilet and it had been cleaned that morning because there was a girl coming and none of the men were allowed to use the toilet until the girl had used the clean toilet and then the men were allowed to use it again. That, like, that used to happen all the time and we are, we are way beyond that, thankfully. Um, but there's still so much that we can do and I think leadership's really important and like that the leaders that are in place now are acknowledging the issues and committing to tackle it and making it more than a tick box exercise but also recognizing the importance of targets and things like that because um you know it it, it is a business issue we won't um we, we won't survive as an industry or as companies without tackling it so why not think about it as a business issue you would put a kpi on a business issue so why not do this and i i wholeheartedly agree with you in terms of role models and coaching and mentoring i, I th i'm sure and i'm um if we get time as host progress i'm going to ask both of you to just give a, a bit of insight into your career because um i know the amazing journeys that you two have been to but not everyone will um but I think we've probably all benefited at some point in our career from a particular sponsor or a mentor or someone who has identified us and picked us up and kind of encouraged us or pushed us through. And I, I think we probably, I certainly feel this anyway, be interested in your perspectives, but I certainly feel an obligation to give that back and to help people that are, that are coming into the, the sector now and encourage them along. But, um, 
thing I want to start by saying is that if you're looking at this uh, particular broadcast and you're in a position to hire people, look to different places. Don't look in the same places. If you have um, a placement firm that is bringing you only white male candidates, get another firm. Because I am one person in one uh, engineering school. There were 25 black engineers in my class 33 years ago. So think about those numbers. There's lots of black engineers, there's lots of brown engineers, there's lots of people who are able to do all these jobs, but they're never presented. So if you have a firm that's telling you they don't have any candidates, they're not looking. I'm looking directly at the camera to say this because I hear this all the time, and it really angers me because I'm not one in a million. I'm not even one in 10,000. There are many of me. So please do that. Then that's, I'll, I'll stop there. But I feel very passionate uh, about this point. I'm gonna, no, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna build on that, and I, I think that when we're thinking about hiring and recruitment and the future workforce, so, so yeah, like statistically in the UK, a really big challenge for the net zero transition has got to be getting. I mean, as you said at the beginning, we to more diverse people into the STEM subjects that we're looking to recruit from, but it's also about changing the image of the sector and our leadership and what we expect people to be and bring to the table because it's really hard to fit into a mold which has been defined by a very narrow demographic for you and, um, and just as a, an actor i got asked all the time about gravitas early on in my career gravitas gra this is a kind of missing thing that you're supposed to have as a chief exec and after a while I worked out that there's a genuine helpful bit of feedback there which is about you know how you present yourself and how neutral audiences perceive you obviously but there's a heavy um, percentage of that was it was about you speak differently and you look differently and you have a different story to a lot of the people that have done your role before and therefore it doesn't look quite right for how we imagine the box that we want you to fit in and so I think we've got to allow from recruiters through to our own HR teams more square pegs and round holes and eventually to change the hole to a square or have more different shaped holes you know we've got to we've got to be much more open about what we think the right person is because the skills are the same you know and I, and I think too often with recruitment we end up focusing by accident on the person not the skills yeah, I've, so I've done um, a number of recruitment rounds over the last couple of years and um, had exactly that with recruitment consultants that you described go, well, we, we've tried, we've tried to find a diverse list of candidates. Um, we managed to get you one female out of a list of 30, like great, great job. Everyone else has got the same degree from the same university on this list, like that's not a diverse. Um, and the last couple of rounds of recruitment that I did, I when I um, got through to kind of the final stage of interviewing, I only interviewed one or two that met the kind of job classification and criteria. And everyone else that I interviewed, I interviewed because they looked interesting. Yeah. So either they'd sent um, a letter in with their application that made me smile or something had grabbed me. And um, I think, without fail, the people that got the jobs were the interesting ones and not the ones that met the criteria. And like, we're talking a lot about diversity, but I think there's a really important thing about regionalism here too, because uh, as we've said, cities tend to be more diverse. If you're looking for people to come and work for you in central London, the candidate pool you get is very different to when you're looking to recruit people from Grimsby, but the challenge is the same. You know, like, you know, we've talked about it. You need to make sure these jobs are available everywhere to everyone, which might mean that you need to think um, about where you go in a local area. You can't just use the same recruitment process, practice, skill set, person spec for every part of the country or countries that you're operating in, I think. I mean, anyone watching this is like, oh, that sounds like a lot of HR, but you know, it's true. I think my message for business is we need to be much more thoughtful about how we approach these challenges if we want to get what is a massive economic transition done well because people are going to stand in our way rightly otherwise you know either because of the infrastructure disruption or because of the lack of benefits for their children or because they're being asked to bear the cost because we didn't think the design of the policy through so yeah now how important do you think it is for the the kind of, this is going to make me sound really old, but for the younger generation <laughs> that are entering or about to enter yeah. into the workforce, I feel like like they've, they've got a real shift in mate. Like you, you, you need to engage yeah. them in what you're doing and, the, and, the, and the, the kind of social purpose, I think, yeah. of what you're doing, which you need to be, you know, it's not enough to go, 
look at this great job that's got a great benefits package and healthcare and things. It's they don't care about that. <laughs> they really want to care about where they're working and um, it's a significant shift. Uh, even the younger folks that work in our company, I think they feel a sense of calling and purpose because we're inventing and investing, excuse me, in climate solutions. I'm not sure they'd feel the same way if it was Exxon coming to recruit them. And the funny thing about me being a chemical engineering major is that I thought I was going to, I worked for Exxon as um, uh, an intern, and I, you know, at the time I decided not to work there, but I thought I was going to be a petroleum engineer. My life is very different, but I think the younger people, they're thinking automatically and immediately about the impact of what their job is on society and life, and that was not what I was doing. I was just trying to make some money. I'm just going to be honest. So it's very <laughs> different now. Yeah, my, they're so terrifying in a good way. I think Obama yesterday said, stay angry. And and you're seeing a lot of the activists being, you know, like, oh, you know, why are they asking us for so much more than we can possibly deliver? And the thing is about business, which is very pragmatic and incremental versus what now is it? There is that gap. But the thing is, I'm sometimes not necessarily sure that them that should change. I think actually it, it is the existing this thing model needs to shift and here's why the reason they're angry is they're also the generation that is fundamentally less invested in this economy it's harder to buy a home to raise a family to have a kind of secure job and then on top of that you're facing the climate crisis so they're yeah they're angry and their expectations of business are obviously you should change this because it's not working for us and i think that's that's pretty admirable um i will say energy uk we've just you know we've just done our a big round of reviewing all our staff policies and we've just done a restructure <laughs> and i thought i was like relatively young and kind of still with it i am not because the expectations of my team were so fierce and they were so challenging all the way through and you know it's it's hard for you if you're in a leadership position to deal with that but they they were so right and we're going to build a better business if we can get it right even if the answer is sometimes like i can't yet but I think they deserve that honesty and they deserve us trying. So, I mean, if you're, if you're watching this, I think, I think to attract young people, yeah, absolutely mission-led, also authenticity and leadership, and also they need to see real progress faster than we've been historically willing to provide it. Say, so I'm going to use my uh, host prerogative now and um, say I've known both of you for quite a long time and I know um, and I'm sure everyone else does now because it will have come across on screen but how impressive you both are and inspirational and I wonder whether we can just finish off we should have done this at the start we're doing it backwards <laughs> just to mix things up but maybe talk a bit through your careers and how you've got to where you are what were the key things that helped you get there and what's your advice I guess that you would give to anyone who's you know either looking to enter the industry they're at school maybe and thinking maybe i want to go into something in the energy sector or someone who's already in the sector and going want to be involved in the decisions what advice would you give them well i'll start just very quickly um i started out as chemical engineering as i said but then i realized i didn't want to actually be a chemical engineer <laughs> so i uh, stole classes i went to university of pennsylvania which includes the wharton school as an undergraduate school so i took a, a lot of my electives from there and i was able to go to morgan stanley uh, my engineering background has helped me every single day because of the way i think and process um, problems and ideas and, and, and solutions um, and i was in the building during 9 11 when it got hit by the airplane so I had also been there when it got bombed in 1993. And I said, well, if they're trying to kill me at work, I better really like my job. <laughs> so I quit that industry and I moved over to the mayor's office of New York City. But because I had that scientific background, I was then put on climate projects because I knew what CO2E meant. I knew what P PM 2.5 meant and understood how to explain that to other people. So throughout my career, my scientific background has helped me. Um, and the only reason I left the mayor's office, I had a great job, loved it, but a new mayor's coming in and we don't have a civil service protection in the mayor's office. So the next mayor can come in and say, you need to find another job elsewhere. And I've survived that already. I worked there 15 years. I said, my luck might be running out. So I was recruited away uh, by this private equity firm. But the thing I will say is all the jobs I've had, except for the first one in each place was, were created for me because someone was watching how hard I worked. Like she can do more than that. I'm going to create a job for her. My job as climate diplomat of New York City was created for me. It did not exist before. So the thing I would say as advice is um, be open to whatever comes your way. My career was all like this 
all over the place, but I landed exactly where I needed to be, and I had to be open to that. And the second thing is you never know who's watching you. The best, the job you have right now is the best job you've ever had. Even if you hate it, don't have a frown on your face. Don't surf the web when your boss walks by. Actually do the work or you need to leave because you don't know who's going to pluck you out of obscurity and give you the chance of a lifetime. And that's happened to me twice in my career. The third thing is that your mentor or sponsor may not look anything like you. Sadly for me, all of my sponsors at all of my jobs have been older white men because they saw how I was not getting treated the way I needed to and they stood up for me. So it might be somebody you don't expect that actually gives you those opportunities. So those are the things that I would say for my career path. I have an unmitigated professional crush on Lolita now, which I'm just <laughs> going to declare. Um, yeah, my uh, similar, similar background, I'm very lucky because I grew up in part of the country where my state schools were excellent and having a good education has changed my life. And I think probably on the coattails of it, my family's life too, which is, you know, a, a nice reflection. My, my mum at my own wedding made fun of my um, Enid Blyton voice. I sound like a 1950s TV show, but actually she says I was just born that way. Um, and so yeah, I'm the first in my family to go to university. And as such, we had sort of no idea what I was doing, which is a preamble to saying I ended up doing classics and English at Oxford because my mum was genuinely like, pick something you think sounds interesting. And like in that, in that wonderful naivety, I ended up doing like a really unusual course and by accident at the best place in the world to do it. And I'm not saying that classics is particularly useful for energy, but the discipline of being in a place like that and how, how broad reaching that degree is, I come back to every single day, particularly with policymakers and constructing an argument when, you know, a, a rush. So, so from Oxford, I then knew that if I spent, you know, I graduated into the recession and I couldn't go home. I couldn't do work experience or anything like that. So I looked for where I could get a job and I went into finance. I did my training contract in finance. And I figured if I did that, no one would ever ask me whether I could add up ever again as a classics graduate either, which they haven't, success. Um, and did some large scale renewable structuring in that job, but it wasn't for me. It's that thing about you've got to love your work. And Frozen Planet came out, which was the David Attenborough series, which in the US I think was uh, voiced by Morgan Freeman. But it was a, the last episode was about climate change. And I remember sitting in my now ex boyfriend's house um, watching it and just completely losing it and realizing that what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was work on decarbonization. So I went to an uh, energy consultancy, having got a little bit of private sector experience, tiny place, four of us, a startup in an attic in Birmingham. So again, you know, take the jobs that are on offer and you never know where they go. And the job that changed my life was in, in my energy consulting job. I happened to be on a panel at party conferences with a recruiting manager at WWF who was looking for the head of the climate change program and a member of the team. And I'd seen the jobs and I pitched myself for a member of the team job, sent in a CV, didn't hear anything. And then eventually they called me back for the head of the team job. And it was such a pun on their behalf. I was like 26 and a two years work experience, but, but I got the job. And from, from there, you know, have worked in renewables and climate change ever since. And I think my messages are kind of the same as yours. You never know where you're gonna end up. The champions in my career have been white guys also, militia white guys who not only championed me, but crucially got out of my way. You know, they were really, really happy for me to have the limelight, have their platform, do the external facing bit of the job, which means I got spotted early by other people other than them for the next promotion. And I think that's extremely generous of a mentor to kind of literally promote you to someone else to hire you. Um, and then I suppose, the other thing that I'd say is purpose-led jobs can take you in interesting directions. So, you know, I'm really proud to work for the energy industry at this particular moment in time because it feels like a massive inflection point. But I'm a climate change activist at my core, so I take jobs which are basically still about climate change to me. And that means I've done lots of different things and they've been very tangential, but the kind of purpose is there. And I think for those of you that are wanting to guide your career, maybe it's the purpose and not necessarily the direct career trajectory that's the thing that you're looking for. So, yeah. I totally agree with that. I'm going, I might add mine in to, yeah. me, to, make, to reinforce the point. Speaking so, of impressive women, <laughs> So, um, so I, similar background, so uh, actually not good school, not good schools, uh, terrible careers advice. Um, I got told, I got advised not to do maths at A-level. Oh, yeah, I got it, told not to do science because I was like a fluffy girl. Yeah, 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 it wouldn't be useful when I was doing <laughs> English as well. 
Um, fortunately, I managed to claw that back over the next few years. Um, so I, um, I, did, I wanted to be a lawyer and um, couldn't afford it. Um, didn't have the money to get to a law degree. So I said, like, right, I'm going to do a business and law degree. Then I'm going to find a firm to sponsor me and then I will convert to my law degree. And that's what I'm going to do. And I went on a placement with Transco, which is one of the predecessors of National Grid, um, who at the time were sponsoring graduates to convert to a law degree. Um, and as it turned out, they stopped doing that before I got to that stage of my career, which was getting. Um, but I had an amazing um, uh, senior manager at the time, who was female, um, but not male, who fought um, really hard to keep me um, in the company and she um, she had me working on the amazed amazingness and she really lit uh, like energy no pun intended within me for the company and the organization and then there's been a few things that have happened to my career amazingly good things and terrible awful things as well that have formed me into who i am as a leader and what i want out of my role but my, my long-winded point was it's very rare now i think to come across anyone who's got a very traditional I want that job in 10 years and this is the route I'm going to get to and I think the point both of you have made in finding the people that will sponsor you and coach you but being open minded because quite often it's the jobs that you look at and go I don't want to do that job that you end up in them anyway so yeah. you know why fight because you know you're going to end up there but they're the amazing jobs because they're the ones that really stretch you and teach you things and, and lead you to places that you just didn't expect to go. And can we add, we didn't, we didn't think about the, um, you asked us or someone asked, asked us about how do you encourage people from diverse backgrounds to take those jobs? And I think the other observation I, I've made often in my career is there is a hair between me and a billion other brilliant women and, and people of color and people of different backgrounds I've worked with and the, the only difference is when a chance came to take a job I was definitely unqualified for, like at WWF or indeed this job, it, you know, massive steps up and these big, really frightening moments. I've locked myself in a cupboard and I had a word with myself and come out and gone, well, I can at least try. And I'm not sure where that sort of sense of security comes from, but it is much harder for people from different backgrounds to have it. And I think people who don't fit the mold second guess themselves more. So I think if there's that kind of cool message from everything we're saying is that you're probably better than you think that you are. And particularly if you come from a different background, that's your strength. So you kind of have to hold on to it and think that you can probably do the job differently if, it, if there's a chance at it, you know, got to put, try and put your hand up. I mean, I imagine when you were when you were on this is the bit that you failed to mention. But when you were on maternity oh, and yeah. got oh, yeah, you yeah. know got offered the job of yeah. C, massive CEO yeah. job, I'm sure <laughs> it went to your mind again. Well, what's what's what is the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is it doesn't go that great. You do something else. <laughs> Actually, my husband and I had a genuine conversation where I was like, right, just so we're aware, if I screw this up, I may never work again because <laughs> it's so visible and. And once you've had a baby, particularly, I mean, my baby was as close as she was three weeks old when I interviewed for this job. And you can't, as a new parent, imagine normality ever returning or your like identity ever returning. She doesn't really, you just change. And so, yeah, the fa it felt hugely risky and a bit cocky and a, and a bit out of my comfort zone. And the truth of it is it was a car crash, you know, and still sometimes is because I'm trying to juggle both. But I'm still good at it. You know, it's still, they were still, I think, God, I hope anyone who's hired me isn't watching this. I, I think they're happy with how I do the job. Um, you know, and I, and I don't regret it, but it felt very, very risky. And I suppose that's the other thing. The jobs that are going to challenge you and allow you to grow will feel a bit scary. The thing you should never compromise on is your sense of who you are. And if you're purpose led to the thing you're trying to do, but everything else, if it feels risky, it's probably manageable and worth having a go at. Yeah. And I just want to add from the American perspective, being a black American, slave descended, so my great great grandmother was a slave. I'm actually part Scottish, so I'm wearing this as my clan, McLennan. Um, 
but be, from growing up that way where my family suffered significant segregation issues, sometimes we um, have an internalization that we talk ourselves out of applying for jobs or talk ourselves out of being able to take jobs. So for me, it was actually a big leap of faith for some of the earlier uh, big jobs that I got, both in Morgan Stanley and in the mayor's office. But I said, if not me, who? If I don't take it, they're not going to, they may not offer it to the next person. And I knew I could do those jobs. What happens with women and also with particularly sometimes minorities in the U.S., uh, for sure, you talk yourself out of it. You think, well, I need to be 110% able to do the job. If I can't, if they just list 10 things and I can't do one thing, I'm not going to take it. You'll get a guy who may say, I can do six, I can figure out the rest. And they do, I see people, I finally talked myself out of it because I saw so many mediocre guys getting these jobs. I'm like, wait a minute, I can do that job. I'm smarter than that yeah. guy. And that's really what spurred me on to move forward. Yeah, right. that exceptional narrative. I'm so bored, you know, the kind of, um, I'm being mean to a particular woman, but the, the kind of lean-in philosophy that you need to be better and exceptional to get ahead if you're different. I have zero time for, possibly because I'm a very tired parent. Like, <laughs> I think you should be able to be as good as the people that have always held those jobs. So, or you different. know, you or know, just different. That's it. That's the standard we're aiming for. Totally. Thank you both so much. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed this last hour. It's been an absolute delight to chat to both of you. Um, hope everyone else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I was just trying to think about how I sum this up, and I think I, I've had a few conversations over the last couple of days with people saying, what is different at this COP compared to Paris? And the, and the message that seems to be coming through is that um, this really feels like it's starting to become mainstream and it's not some you know political negotiators in a room talking things through it's much wider and there's much greater um, breadth of people involved and engaged and I, I, I hope the conversation over the last hour has just shown how important it is for that for the conversation to enc encompass a huge um, a hugely diverse range of people so um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your fantastic um, questions and thank you again to Emma and Lolita.